What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Journal. Welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. This time, we're actually on the main menu screen because, as you may recall from the last episode, we unlocked something new in the bonuses section, which I actually I don't remember, which is kind of silly. Um, but I don't remember if that was there before. Also, you guys can see that I alternate which file I save on just in case something bad happens with the recording and I need to go back. Um, welcome to the world of of YouTube. <laughs> but bonuses unlock bonus features by progressing through the game and solving mysteries and puzzles. The range of features on each save file will vary. So I believe what we uncall or we, we uncovered was one of Layton's challenges. There's a weekly puzzle? Wow, what a what a cool mechanic. I'm obviously bet it's not really relevant now, but I want to see what's under Layton's challenges. The inventor's house. Interesting. Test your wits against the hardest puzzles the professor has to offer. Do you have what it takes to solve them? Huh. I don't know if this is something I should save until later. I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wait to hear from you guys as to whether or not I should do these now. They feel like a fun, I guess, like post-game bonus episode taking on, you know, the most difficult challenges. So I think we'll, we'll do that another time. Uh, for the time being, though, we'll continue with our... I guess, attempt at making our way to Reinhold Manor. It's obviously taking quite a bit of time for us. Okay. Story so far. This should be the same as when we last read it. So, we checked out the candies. Oh! Our dog friend. Hello there. I don't know if that was relevant for some reason, or... Is there anything new? No? Okay. All right, we'll head on out then. Um, let's chat with our friend here. Because we have not talked to him yet. Hey there, Professor. I bet you're here to solve my puzzle. I'm right, aren't I? Yeah, of course I'm right. Ooh, a little full of ourselves, are we? <laughs> the longest path. 50 pick rats. Talking about a big puzzle here. Two boys are playing a game in which the goal is to take the longest route possible from point A to B, as shown on the map below. The only rule is that no section of road can be traversed more than once. What course should they take in order to cover the longest distance possible between points A and B? Okay. So, um, I guess the first thing that stands out is the symmetry of this road. Um, hmm. This is so interesting. What comes to mind immediately is something like this, where we go this way, and then come down, and then go up, and around? I guess this doesn't really matter so much. Something like this? That seems to me to be the longest route, but but is it really? Because hmm, what if we were to get I don't know really really creative? I guess the first thing is we want to note is we want to be using these longer sections rather than the shorter sections, and we can't use them all. I guess I could have I could have done a little bit better snaking, right? So if I were to do something like this, and then go across here, and then up like that, and then over, I think that is technically more coverage. Because then we're only missing out on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight small segment lengths. I guess is what we'll say, because these are all you know rectangles, right? and whatever their smallest side is. Um, we're missing eight of that length. Is there any way to optimize this? The thing is... Hmm... We can only take... So just kind of analyzing it, right? So we have this top row area here um, that I'm kind of drawing a path around right now something, this top row here. I can only take 
one of the vertical short lengths, because if I take two of them, I give up one of the long horizontal lengths. Right? If I want to take two of them to come back up, I have to give up one of the horizontal lengths, um, which ultimately is not advantageous. So I can only take one of them. The question is, which one? Well, I have to take this one. I want to take both of the horizontal lengths, right? Which would mean I'd have to do this. Although I haven't really considered going down the, the other way first. So what if I were to do this and then try to reach around? Something like... I don't know, this? But even then, you're still giving up quite a bit of space. Right? At that point, we're giving up one two, or about two, right? Or one, two, three large lengths, four large lengths, and one, two, three, four small lengths. So that's definitively worse than the previous one. I'm trying to find a way to prove it to myself, right? I like, I have an intuition that what we did before was actually correct, but I'm trying to instill confidence in myself that that has to be the longest route, you know? But yeah, if we ever go down one of these vertical paths, we can't go back up the other um, without giving up one of these horizontal lengths. So I think, although, it kind of looks like... Actually, no, we have a guarantee that it's not... I was going to say, what if the smaller lengths of the rectangles, you know, are actually half of the longer side? Um, because then giving up two small segments would be equivalent to giving up one long side. But this segment in the figure um, in the middle here tells us that that's not the case because we have two small lengths um, contained within one large length with a little bit of leeway as well in this center area. So... We know that the smaller lengths, two smaller lengths, is smaller than one of the long sides of the rectangle. So I think our first move will always be this, where we come down here. I feel pretty confident in that. So the question then is, what do we do from here? We want to utilize as many I guess, like, long lengths as possible. And there are a couple, you know, solutions that are relatively equivalent. So, if we were to do something like this... Oh, that's actually not quite the same as if I were to do this. Where it's like, you come up here... And then we're to go like that and then down and around yeah I mean I, I still think this is gonna be our best solution because at every turning point there's no way you can go back without overlapping and again this is our one two three four five six seven eight small lengths option interestingly enough it's always kind of like eight segments uh, that don't get used, and I'm sure there's some way to prove that that will always be the case, and so um, maybe our job then is to just minimize it so all eight segments are small segments like we've done here, but I can't really think of a better way to go about this. Because we've utilized as many long sides as we can. So I think I'm going to submit this. Just to check, they're not going to let me like go through houses or they're not going to let me go around outside the map, are they? <laughs> no? Okay. Interesting that they let me do that. Um, Alright, I mean, oh wait, I almost messed it up there. I think this is our best solution for now. 
uh, we'll give it a go and, and hope for the best. If I need to Luke, here's my answer. build further on that. No, okay, I don't. Another we got puzzle it. Solved. All right, let's see what they have to say for the explanation. Speaking of leisurely strolls, have you been outside today? If it's not, if it's sunny, why not go for a nice walk? That's a good, good point. I was hoping they would do some more explanation as to why this has to be the longest route and why you can't possibly have anything more, but, but they didn't. <laughs> I'm not. I guess I didn't get the proof I was expecting, but, or rather hoping for. Bang up job there, professor. Even that puzzle didn't phase you, huh? Of course not. You're a pro. Yep, you're a real piece of work, prof. You know that. Of course you do. You're a scholar, after all. <laughs> what an interesting character. Alright, well, if that is the case, we'll keep on going this way. I don't think we have much of a choice. Any new puzzles with the boat, the river? I'd wager the stream connects to the river outside. Anything off in the distance? No, doesn't seem so. Then I guess we'll keep on heading over to the manor. Oh, we have, uh, the cat. What's what's her name again? Claudia? Yeah, well, if it isn't Claudia out and about. That reminds me of a puzzle. Give it a try, my boy. <laughs> not even a... Not even gonna try to transition there. <laughs> oh, isn't Claudia out and about? Oh, that reminds me of a puzzle. <laughs> there are three different colors of plush cats before you. The color of a cat denotes its weight. Examples one and two show their relative weights. Okay. You have three red cats and four black cats loaded on one side of the scale. On the other side of the scale, there are four white cats and one black cat. And so, we have to decide, is it going to tip to the left, right, or be balanced? Interesting. Okay, and so they, they tell us in the examples um, what things are... Oh, I can't even... I can't write. I can't draw on the touch screen. Um, that's unfortunate, but they tell us what things are equivalent, right? So four white cats are equivalent to five black cats. Um, so at first glance, when we look at this, we have four white cats on the right side, and we have four black cats on the left. That would put things a little bit in terms of, um, what's it called? The, the white cat side would be a little bit heavier, right? Because if you were to take one away from the, the black cats in figure one, um, it would then tip to the left because that right side would be getting lighter. So, so at first glance, it looks like the left side would be a little bit um, lighter just from that first diagram. However, we haven't taken into account the second diagram yet. And what the second diagram says is that the the two black cats plus a white cat are equivalent to the three reds. So we have three reds on the left side. We also have four black cats on the left side. So, the four black cats... <laughs> I should write this down, honestly. Um, the four black cats on the left side are kind of like minus one black cat. So, that's why... I, I guess I'm trying to keep in terms of like which side is going to be heavier, right? So, um, the, the left side is going to be minus one black cat from neutral, so it would be lighter. Now, when we take into account the second diagram, we have three reds on the left, and on the right we would have, what, two blacks and a white. Now, we obviously have, from what we haven't accounted for, um, or what we haven't already accounted for, um, just one black and one white cat. So right is minus one black and minus one white. In terms of just equivalency, right? So given that both sides are minus one black cat, we can kind of cross those out. And it looks like the right side is actually short one white plush cat. Meaning the right side would be lighter and the left side would fall down. It would tip to the left. So again, uh, just to run through that again, just keeping track, right? Using figure one, um, we would have four whites on the right and then four black cats on the left. Um, however, we would need five there to be balanced, so that would tip things towards the right, right? Because we would be missing, we'd be down one black cat on the left. And then using the second diagram, we have three red cats on the left, meaning in order to be balanced, we would need the equivalent of a white 
and two black cats on the right. We only have one black cat, so we are down one white cat and one black cat. And then, because we're down one black cat on both sides, those kind of offset each other, and we're missing one right cat, or one white cat on the right. Meaning that right side is going to be lighter, and it's going to tip towards the left. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that reasoning. So, will the scale tip left, tip right, or stay level? So, it'll tip left, because the right side will be lighter. Let's, uh, let's give it a go, I guess. I think I've got it! Alright! Legend's Apprentice saves the day! We're saving the day, guys. <laughs> Excellent. If you replace the red and white cats with black ones, this puzzle becomes much simpler. Once you make the replacement, you'll have six black cats on the right and six black cats plus a little white one on the left. Thus, the scale must tip on the left. That's too funny. So, I definitely overcomplicated it. But, oh, you could just substitute in that regard. Although, that is... That is technically what I did, but I didn't view it in that same way, which, if I were to do so, would make this a lot more obvious. <laughs> Once you realize how you need to look at things, it's not a terribly difficult problem now, is it? Okay, we'll finally head into the manor. Any interesting puzzles going on? Anything of interest? Baron Augustus Reinhold. Nope. Okay. Looks like, uh... Oh! Hello there! <laughs> Is it just that, like, if we click around enough, um, if we tap on enough things, it'll it'll show up? That's funny. Alright, we'll head on up. See what urgent, urgent matter has occurred in the manor. Are you trying to poison me? What are these vile things? You oaf? Some butler you are? Yikes. I'm so sorry, sir. They look pretty yummy to me. I detest sweets. The very sight of them turns my stomach. Get that plate out of here at once. <laughs> As if Matthew could have ever predicted that. Poor Matthew. Mm hmm? Ah, Leighton. There you are. You requested our presence, Inspector Chelly. My sources tell me you've been out snooping about and interfering in my case. Just what are you up to? It certainly wasn't my intention to interfere in your case. However, a few things don't make sense. Leave the investigating to the police, and go chase after that golden apple or whatever it is. Don't you worry about your pretty little head about it. I'll find Simon's killer. Of that you can be sure. Hmm. Now, unless you have something else to say, I've got work to do here. Understood. Good day, sir. So the urgent matter was just us coming over so he could scold us for interfering? What? That inspector has some nerve dismissing us like that. Like I said before, I don't like him one bit. Mm, it is kind of suspicious, almost at this point. I mean, it is not unreasonable to tell somebody who you don't really know is, uh, I guess, good, or even good at what they do, um, trying to investigate when you're the detective, so it, it wouldn't be unreasonable for somebody like that to say, hey, you should really sit this out and leave it to the professionals. On the other hand, this admittedly seems a little bit more suspicious to me, right? Like, stop investigating, I think you might be onto something, and I'm trying to cover it up, right? What do you say we go ask Raymond about yesterday, Luke? Ah, yes, love it, Leighton. Just immediately is like, yeah, I'm gonna keep investigating anyways. So the question then is going to be, where are we going to find Raymond? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Hello there. General Kenobi. <laughs> Good day, Raymond. How are you feeling today? Fit as a fiddle now, Professor. Perhaps even as vivacious as a violin. <laughs> that awful fatigue from last week seems like it never happened. As you can see, I'm bursting with energy and my skin is soft as a baby's. I feel like a teenager again. Is that so? That's good to hear. He doesn't seem to remember what happened yesterday, does he? Yeah, that's very odd. He has no idea what happened. Hmm. So, what's our next move? We shall respect the inspector's wishes and leave the murder case alone, Luke. It's as Inspector Chelmy said, solving crime is the police's job. Besides, something tells me that this case and the Golden Apple are more related than we, sus or we suspect. That's that intuition of yours talking again, isn't it, Professor? <laughs> First and foremost, we need to find a clue that will bring us closer to the Golden Apple. 
Perhaps one of Baron Reinhold's relations or close friends can help point us in the right direction. Of course, there's also someone else. Let's see if the family butler has anything to say on the subject. Fair enough. Chapter 5, The Hunt Begins. It's finally time to start the search for the Golden Apple. Explore St. Mysterio for clues. Sure, we'll save. It's fine by me. Alright, so we have entered a new chapter. And with that new chapter comes many new possibilities for puzzles. So let's go chat with Matthew and see see if he has anything interesting for us. Back so soon, Professor? Matthew, I was wondering if you knew anything that could point us in the right direction of the Golden Apple. Anything you know would be a great help. For example, did the Baron say anything before he passed away? I'm so sorry to disappoint you, Professor, but the Master never said anything of the sort to me. I'd very much like to help you in your search, but my duties here prevent me from leaving the grounds. If only Ingrid was around to provide some assistance. Ingrid? I beg your pardon, sir. Ingrid? Well, I don't think we've heard her before. It's been years since she left, but Ingrid used to work as a servant in the mansion. She was Flora's nurse, and she often helped me with my work. Matthew! Yikes. Yes, madam. I'll be right there. Please excuse me, sir. The lady calls. If you're curious about Ingrid, why not pay her a visit and talk to her yourself? Let's see, at this time of day, I'd imagine she's out walking around by the general store. Please do me a favor and tell her that Matthew sends his regards. Certainly. I'll be sure to pass on your message. Thank you for all your help, Matthew. Interesting. Isn't Ingrid that sweet old lady we passed by before? Oh, you're right. Indeed, we also saw her in that picture of young Flora. Come, Luke, let's go find that old girl. Off we go, then. <laughs> the general store is just outside the mansion, right? We'll be there in no time. That's right, that's where we did the candied thing, right? Hello there. Maybe I should try to click on our robo pupper whenever I see that. I'll go for that next time. Okay, we're almost there. And there's Ingrid. We're going to talk to Marco first, though. Because we all know he might be stocked up with another puzzle now. Lady Dahlia sure is gorgeous, ain't she? Yep, sure is. <laughs> what a dish. What a doll. What a honey. Gals like that are pretty rare, I tell you. Yep, yep. <laughs> I was waiting for the... That reminds me of my old girlfriend who gave me this puzzle or something like that. <laughs> oh, goodness me. If it isn't Mr... Mm, Mr. Layabout... <laughs> <laughs> Was it? The name's Layton, madam. That's right, Mr. Layton. What can I do for you, sir? Earlier we were talking with the butler at Reinhold Manor, and he mentioned you used to work there. We'd very much like to hear anything you might know about the Baron. Heavens me, you want to hear about the Baron? I'm afraid the only stories I have are from when I worked at the manor, and that was ages ago. That would be ideal, madam. Would you mind telling us one? Only if you can solve this puzzle. Alright, well, I suppose I could tell you a bit about the Baron and his former wife. The way Master Reinhold and his wife would carry on, they almost seemed to be like children. You'd never seen a man so in love as M Master Reinhold was. When she passed away, Flora was all the Baron had to remember her by. So he raised that little girl with all the love a child could want. The things he'd bring home for her. Toys from all over the world and teddy bears as big as yourself. He was in high spirits in those days. He really wanted to give her two parents' worth of affection. So, where has Flora gone? Your guess is as good as mine, sir. I have no clue where that girl went. She left the mansion well after I stopped working for the Reinholds. Some say Lady Dahlia put Flora on the street to keep the family riches to herself, but that's nonsense. After all, the Baron cared about Flora so much, I can't imagine that he'd allow something like that. You know, you just reminded me. The grave of the Baron's late wife is located in the manor garden. I wonder who takes care of it now. The Baron's former wife is buried in the garden. Thank you, madam. You've been extremely helpful. Interesting. Luke, let's head back to the manor. I have a hunch that the grave might hold the clue we've been looking for. Are we about to go grave digging? Is that what we're about to do, Layton? Is Layton about to go grave digging? Oh, it's our pupper friend. Oh, I tried, tried uh, interacting with her, but no luck. Um... Interesting. Oh, hello there, Matthew. <laughs> Pacing back and forth off of the distance. Hmm? Oh, look, it's Matthew. 
Good day, Professor. Were you able to track down Ingrid? Yes, we did. In fact, we were just speaking with her. I mean, no disrespect, but she said the grave of the Baron's late wife lies on these grounds. Do you have any knowledge of this? Lady Violet's grave, sir. I was just about to visit myself. Would you mind if we came along to take a look? Not in the slightest. Right this way. Ooh, we've got a new area to explore. Here is the entrance, sirs. Please watch your step on the way in. Wow. This is Lady Violet's grave. What a... What a scene. What a grave. Gosh, this place is really nice. It's not creepy at all. The late Baron, rest his soul, told me to keep this place in proper order, and I have tried to do so. Here sleeps Violet, my one true love. The statue looks so much like Lady Dahlia, it's hard to believe it's someone else. Yeah, and I can't imagine Lady Dahlia would take very well to the inscription of my one true love, but... Back when Flora was just a tiny little thing, Lady Violet used to take her to the park in town. Some of the flowers in the garden grew from the ones Flora planted here for her mother. Oh, I forgot to tell you about the Baron's journal. It should still be on the desk in Madame's room. It's possible that it might contain some information that could aid your search for the Golden Apple. So after this, we gotta go into the mansion and go up to the Baron's room. My thanks, Matthew. I'll be sure to give it a once-over later. Now then, Luke, we'd best head back to Reinhold Manor. No puzzles at the grave? Huh. Interesting. Alright, well, well, we'll head on over to Dahlia's room and see what we can find. I wonder if she'll even allow us in. Honestly, would not be surprised if she did not. Anything in the chandelier again? Nope. Fireplace. Ah, hint coin. Lovely. Couch? Under the couch? Under the rug? No? Okay. Then we'll continue forward. This, I believe, is Lady Dahlia's room. Did we find a puzzle over here, or what may this be? This is the journal itself. This must be the journal that Matthew spoke of. I have to admit, he seems to know where everything in the manor is. There's something about reading someone else's journal that just doesn't seem proper to me. However, the investigation must continue, so... So here we go. The craftsmanship of it is simply remarkable. It reminds me of my sweet Violet when she was alive. What do you suppose it refers to? It's the statue, the grave. Flora doesn't like the thing at all. I've seen her run away from it on multiple occasions. Recently, she spends more time playing by dear Violet's grave than anywhere else. I'm sad to say I doubt Flora will ever take to it. I can't blame her, as I've changed its memory. What? I felt terrible forcing that change on Flora, but I just couldn't bear to see it like that anymore. Violet, there can never be another you. You are my first, my last, and my only. Changed its memory? I'm not sure what the Baron means, but this is clearly vital information here. Yeah, no kidding! I at first thought he was talking about the statue. Hmm. It sounds like Lady Dahlia. It sounds like he's talking about Lady Dahlia, honestly. I collapsed some days ago and have been bedridden ever since. I feel as if I have failed Flora as a father. I can only hope that when I am gone, the people of the village look after Flora and care for her as I did. Interesting that he doesn't mention Lady Dahlia. He must have been terribly ill. It seems I am not long for this world. The time has come for me to say goodbye to my little Flora. I've left everything in Bruno's care now. Flora, I pray you find happiness in this life. Bruno? I've disclosed the location of the secret place in a note that I've left with an old friend. It is my most fervent hope that the Seeker of the Golden Apple finds it and grants my dearest wish. Oh my. Well, that's quite the clue there, isn't it? <laughs> Professor! Baron Reinhold's old friend. We must seek out this person, Luke. But, Professor, how can we possibly find that person with nothing but this journal to go on? Haha, <laughs> it's like I always say, Luke. Any good investigation starts on the street. We'll just have to ask everyone in town about the matter. What? I mean, of course, you're absolutely right, Professor. Let's get to it. Of course, any good investigation also needs direction. Let's start out by asking Ingrid a few questions. She seems to know a great deal about Baron Reinhold. 
Ooh, so that's really interesting. I'm really eager to see where this goes. So, it seems like the Baron himself might have been behind a lot of the memory alteration. I wonder if it's being used for, I guess, um, un or what the <laughs> not what the Baron would have liked, uh, now that the Baron has been, um, I guess, the, since the Baron has passed away. I'm wondering though, something just crossed my mind, what if the Baron didn't actually die? <laughs> What if the Baron is the rogue one who going around and wiping people's memories? I don't know. I don't know. Oh my, we have quite a few people here. Let's chat with Lady Dahlia first. Oh, Professor, how fortunate that you're here at a time like this. I have a favor to ask of you. Please, Madam, ask away. I'm happy to come to your aid in any way I can. Thank you, Professor. Could you solve this puzzle for me? <laughs> Though I'm not feeling up to the challenge, it won't solve itself. <laughs> Can you do this for me? I'm lazy. How old is mom? Okay. Father and son are having a conversation. The father turns to the son and says, You know, son, there was a time when your old man was twice the age of your mother. Okay. Of course, the next year, I was only one and a half times her age. But still, that's pretty amazing, eh? If the father is 44 years old, how old is the mother? So, I'm pretty sure they're only one year apart. <laughs> Just because when you go from double somebody's age to 1.5 times their age, after one year, I mean, I'm pretty sure you can, you can solve this with some algebra. But uh, but the numbers, I mean, if they start at one year old and then two years old, and that's when, oh, the father was two years old, the mother was one years old, so he was double her age, next year, two and three, that would be 1.5 times, so it makes it seem like they're just one year apart, and the mother is one year younger than the father, which would make her 43. But just to be safe, I guess, there was a time when your old man was twice the age of your mother. Okay, so let's say uh, the father's age is X, and we'll say the mother's age is Y. At one point in time, X was equal to 2Y. And then we have another equation, because when you add 1 to each of them, it becomes 1.5, right? So X plus 1 is equal to 1.5 times Y plus 1, right? And so then what you can do is you can plug in and solve, and you'd get... Uh, using the substitution method, you get 2y plus 1 is equal to 1.5y plus 1.5. You get 0.5y is equal to 0.5, or in other words, y is equal to 1, so x is equal to 2. Yeah, that's, that's the solution. So, if the father is 44 years old, the mother must be 43. Yeah, they're one year apart. <laughs> Interesting. That should do it. All right, would have been embarrassed if I got that Every one wrong after an uh, feeling like I had it relatively confidently. That's right, the mother is 43, and the boy's father, yada yada yada. <laughs> what a relief, I can finally stop thinking about that silly puzzle as if you were thinking about it. <laughs> you have my thanks. A splendid painting. We'll give it to Leighton for now. We still have plenty of uh, room in our rooms, so I'm not too worried about that just yet. Let's chat with Chelmy. Oh, it's our pupper. What does the dog do? I don't know. Mr. Leighton, you have some skill at solving puzzles, yes? I once cracked a case by solving a puzzle left behind on a note I found hidden at the crime scene. Let's see how you fare against it. Oh my, quite the challenge. It's gonna be 50. Ooh, 40, the mysterious note. Okay, so but pretty formidable. A detective who was mere days from cracking an international smuggling ring has suddenly gone missing. While inspecting his last known location, you find a note. The note appears to be nothing more than a series of numbers, but your gut instinct tells you that this note will reveal the name of the crime kingpin. Currently, there are three suspects in the case, Bill, John, and Todd. Can you break the detective's code and find the criminal's name? 
So we have to find the criminal's name. From within this. Hmm. Um, at first glance, this thing that I circled here looks like it could be a backwards comma. But the rest of the things don't look like they would be, uh... Hmm. <laughs> I think, uh... I think, I think I see it now. I was thinking, like, oh, is it backwards or something like that? And if you were to rotate this, it's written like it's numbers, but if you were to read this backwards and upside down, it says, Bill is boss, he sells oil. Right? The nine is a B, then I, then the sevens are L's, the fives are S's, the three is an E, the one is an I. Yeah, I think so. Bill is boss, he sells oil. <laughs> I think that's it. I, I don't think there would otherwise be enough to translate this into... Your, use these numbers to come up with something that represents uh, anything meaningful. That you could translate to the, you know, a four-letter word. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Bill. I think that's really what they intend. I think it would be highly... Highly coincidental or weird uh, if it were not the solution And it just happened to be that So let's go with Bill There we go All right, now let's hope I got it right Every for the right reason <laughs> And didn't just luck out Bill is boss. He sells oil. There it is. That's too funny. Wow, and it's just that one mark that looked like a comma that kind of got my brain in that mindset. Impressive, Mr. Layton. It seems the rumors touting your skill weren't totally unfounded. But don't go getting any ideas. Do the smart thing and leave the detective work to me. In the meantime, you can occupy yourself by searching for the golden apple. We're getting a decent number of painting scraps now. That's pretty good. Alright, now we'll chat with Gordon. Oh, Professor, you just simply have to help me. I've got another puzzle on my hands I just can't solve. As a man of the world, you know there's nothing women find more alluring than competence. <laughs> not skill, not excellence. Competence. I'm counting on you, sir. Don't do me to an eternal bachelorhood. <laughs> Is that like all his character is about? Pinboard shapes. Another 40 picaret puzzle. Okay. The cross shape on the pinboard below has 9 pins inside it and 16 outside it. Remember that example, because now it's your turn to construct a shape on the board. Can you create a cross that has 17 pins inside it and 16 outside it? Can I create a cross? Interesting. That has 16 inside and 17 outside, or 17 inside and 16 outside. I guess part of what's going to be difficult is I, I need to increase relative to this example. I need to increase the number of pins inside it while also increasing the number of pins outside it. Um, why is that important? Well, it means that I need to increase the number of pins that actually count as either inside or outside, period. Meaning I need to use less pins involved in the the border of the shape so how are we going to do that we're going to have to make a cross using diagonals that's the first thing that comes to mind and it can't be a diagonal that would include or i guess would be like a, a slope of one on this grid so if I were to do something like this, for example.
Even then, though... Hmm... this really work? Does it have to be like a regular cross? Feel free to make your cross any size you like. I think the tough part is, do they want it to be the exact same shape? Because to me, any cross is any sort of um, shape with, I guess, four appendages <laughs> that uh, are perpendicular to each other at the center. That'll be really tough to do on a slant, though. But we will definitely need to do that. <laughs> There's no doubt about that to me. Because without that, um, we won't have enough pins to include. In fact, how many pins do we need, right? We can actually figure that out. So currently we have 9 inside and 16 outside. We need to have 17 inside and 16 outside, right? So we need to add 8 pins. Yeah, we need to add eight pins in total. Meaning, in order to use our cross, or whatever pins we use to make our cross, let's count how many we've used. Three, five, 11, 13, 19, 21, 24. So we've used 24. So we need to make a cross using 16 pins. That's our objective, using 16 of them. Hmm. Using 16. Importantly, what does that mean? Well, if whenever you make a cross shape, right, it has to have some sort of Point like this one here where it's the the link between the two arms and it has to have four of those right maybe not but probably probably four of those and for every appendage on the cross um, to make it so that it's a star more so than a cross it needs to have two so already we're at 12 of those 16 pins used and then we can afford to use four in some other manner whether that's going from the center points to the outer points or not but we need to use exactly 16 pins and I guess you can also figure that out in terms of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so there are 49 pins on the board um, and of course we have 16 and 17 that we need inside and outside respectively uh, that adds up to 33, which would leave 16 pins um, unused or not counting as either inside or as outside, which means they would be part of the cross shape. So that's reassurance with regards to how many pins we can actually use. Hmm. How would we want to do this, though? I don't know. Would we do something like this? No, because I mean, we're already using quite a few at this point. Um, could try it for the sake of just to see how this goes. Something like this. Yeah, this is not quite gonna do it. It's a little bit closer. Um, you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen inside 
um, the structure, but not quite enough. So we need to find a way to encompass even more. Even more. Hmm. At first glance, well, let's actually, out of curiosity, let's see how many are outside. These ones where I'm technically not using the pin, right, at the arms of the cross here, I'm not using the pins, but they're probably like right on the border that it's not very easy to tell. But outside of the cross, there would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Um, so yeah, again, a little bit off the mark, but we, we knew that already. <laughs> um, how do we want to do this? I've got an idea. So what if, I guess one way to look at it might also be, if I were to start from the center and go out to make an arm, where would I need to draw a line in order to, in, I guess, capture four of the uh, dots? And as you can see, it's um, not going to work that way. There's no way that I can do this in capture four. So. I need to have four sort of center points, um, those internal points that I was referring to earlier, like this one, this one, and this one. So where would I put those? something interesting might be I mean at first glance I don't think it matters much if it's centered but but maybe I can get creative if I don't keep it centered so if I were to do something like this where then I maybe have like an arm go out this way and then an arm go this way <laughs> It's not a regular cross by any means, but it is still a cross, if you ask me. Something like that? I mean, that's not going to be enough. Is it? Five, three, two, no. That's only slightly better. But the principle stands, right? So, I could do something like this where we come out a little bit further and then go out like that although this is just rotated isn't it yeah this is not going to be too helpful hmm something like this but then it goes all the way down there so it's like a really big uh, cross like that something like that one three or er, right what six nine eleven who close 15 but still not quite How many would be outside though? Because I feel like I still used a lot of... Yeah, I feel like I used even more <laughs> pins in actually making the borders of the cross itself. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 
So not too far off, actually. All things considered. So I think, actually, what, what would happen if we tried to widen the cross that's in the example? So if we were to do something like... Well, that might be too much. So maybe not widen it completely, but something like this. thing is, I think we take out too many, or no, darn it, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that. I guess for uh, learning purposes. <laughs> we'll take a look at this in just a moment. Um, so we have one, and then in on the inside here, there's five per row, right? So this would be five, 10, 15, and then 16, 17 inside. How many would be outside? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two. 12. So, or no, actually even fewer than that. Just eight. So that's problematic, obviously, with, with how many things it uses, how many pins it uses, because we need to have 16 on the outside. Hmm. So yeah, we, we definitely need to use diagonals. The question is just how. proving to be tougher than I'd anticipated. But not out of reach, which is nice. think it's also not like a huge grid right it's a seven by seven grid I want to know what they define as a cross do they need to be perpendicular arms like I thought or like I think they do it probably doesn't need to be centered so I could do something like Does it need to be though? I mean, this obviously wouldn't work because it's using way too many um, things. But but it doesn't need to be centered, does it? I think it does. <laughs> I think it does. I think I'm stretching. Or that would be stretching the uh, the definition of a cross too much. Hmm. I mean, the thing is, it's it's fairly... Well, is it? I don't know. I think we need to change up the shape. Did this really not work? I feel like this should work. Because when you look at it compared to the original cross shape, we're eliminating exactly eight spots. But this didn't, did it? I feel like it should. No, it didn't. It did not work. It's close. It's close. Hmm. 
What if... What if I did something like this? Where the arms are like that. I think this may actually work. Because we've cut out, I believe, exactly eight. Granted, well, I don't know how they're gonna deal with these, these ones here, right? Like, are they gonna count that as one side or what? I don't know. I mean, when you look at it, right? We have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, we have we have seventeen inside. And how many do we have outside? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So we're at 12 and then the four, right? One, two, three, four. That's 16. And then we have the four that are on the borders of the arms of the cross. I mean, this looks like the right solution to me. I'm just afraid of how they're going to count those pins that are on the the edges of the arms that are technically not pinned, but they're definitely not inside or outside because the border of the cross is going through their slots, right? Or at least that's what I think, just to count again, right? We have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then five. So 17 inside. Then on the outside, we'd have one, two, three, one, two, three in each corner. So 12, and then one at each, um, I guess, like cardinal direction. So four. Yeah, I mean, I think this is it. Um, the only other thing I can think of is like, oh, if this is wrong, we'll need to actually, I guess, click on the different pin cushions um, or the pins on those arms that are currently not highlighted right now and are kind of just on the border. But I think this is it. So we'll submit it and see how it goes. There we go. That's it. Every puzzle has an answer. All right. <laughs> um, this puzzle is a cinch when you figure out that it just has to be on a diagonal. <laughs> Thanks, old boy. With this puzzle solved, I feel I've drawn one step closer to the old. <laughs> Crack me up. We'll give Luke the, the clock so he's not staying up too late at night playing games, solving puzzles. All right, speaking of playing games and solving puzzles, in the next episode, we're going to keep playing this game and solving more puzzles as we... What are we going to do? Talk to Ingrid. Talk to Ingrid, yes, because we need to get to know relatives... Not relatives. Close friends of the Baron so that we can find this note that's going to lead us to the golden apple. It's quite the impressive clue uh, right off the bat, so pretty excited to see where it goes, and of course the puzzles were, were great this episode, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching me solve them. Um, and for those of you that are you know blind to this game as well, I hope you had fun trying to solve them yourselves, if that's something you're doing. But yeah, I, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where the story goes, looking forward to seeing what puzzles are ahead. But until the next episode, it's Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.